a much better deal. But I've wanted to make a new SQL to Elite for a very, very long time. Um, there have been uh, challenges working with publishers, and there was so much more that I wanted to do until now. And this is a fantastic opportunity created by things like Kickstarter and by, I suspect, many of you in this audience who have helped help get us there, help back us. So um, let's turn the sound down just a bit. So in November 2012, we launched a campaign on Kickstarter. Uh, we had the game in development on and off for a long time. And we had lots of little pieces of code coming together. So that when we went on Kickstarter, we did have some things we could show. This video, for example, came out during the Kickstarter campaign. Um, we completed in January 2013, and it was, it's a very, very interesting experience. For the first time, we're essentially pitching in a completely public marketplace. Everything is, it's, it's completely different to pitching to a publisher, but also, in many ways, very much better. I'll talk a little bit about that later, but the, the whole process, you know, people have been, um, have asked, say, well, all right, why, why Kickstarter? Surely, the prob if you have problems with publishers, you're going to have problems 500 times or 50,000 times over when you're going through Kickstarter. Actually, it's the opposite, because we're all, all aligned. We all want the game for ourselves. We're not wanting it for an imagined audience. That makes such a difference. So, by January 2013, now, it actually crossed the line. What By that, I mean the funding target. So, for those of you who don't know, with Kickstarter, if you don't get your target, you get nothing. Anyway, it crossed the line on my 50th birthday, on January the 2nd, 2013. And then, uh, a few days later, it, it, it finished. We raised over um, $2 million, um, 1.54 something million pounds, and it's since gone on. Many, many more people have joined us. Um, we're approaching 3 million now, and it's very, very exciting in terms of what that's enabled us to do. But it's also a phenomenal awareness campaign. The key thing with Kickstarter is it built a really big audience. We had a belief in the audience. One of the problems with a game like this that's been around for a long time is you don't actually know what the level of interest is and how much of that is, is nostalgia. You know, a lot of people say, oh, we, we love Frontier, we brought up with Frontier. Others, we loved Elite, we brought up Elite. You don't know whether that's a few hundred people or whether it's enough to support a game. And the great thing about Kickstarter is it demonstrated to us that it was the latter. So once Kickstarter was done, the development began in earnest, and that was very, very exciting. Many of you, I ho hope, have seen the regular newsletters we've been putting out, the dev diary videos of me looking variously dis uh, um, disheveled, wearing jumpers and all sorts of things. But the point is, with this, um, that I really enjoyed is we were developing the game for ourselves. It really felt like a throwback to the 1980s. Um, one of the pledge levels on Kickstarter was to join something called the Design Discussion Forum, where people had input in the game. And we actually changed it. It was very active discussion. Um, we changed quite a few aspects of the game as a result of that. And in Alpha 4 that was released last week, we actually see some of the results of those um, redesigns. We redesigned the way hyperspace was going to work, and also introduced something called Super Cruise that you'll, you'll see in a minute. So also with this, we put in place a really detailed plan of how to deliver the game. Um, and the key thing was something that we've always strongly believed in, is you tackle the biggest risks first. You know, the order of development should be to knock on the head things that can kill the game. Now, everyone says that, but actually, when you're developing um, with, through publishers, there's something that's come up that many of you will recognize, I'm sure, which is the vertical slice. So who here knows and has made a vertical slice? Right, <laughs> that's at least two thirds of the hand. So you know exactly what I mean. The problem with that, it's, it's, it's absolutely understandable and laudable goal to have a slice of the game, but actually, in practice, it means you are prioritizing things that are n almost no risk at all over very high risks, just so that you have a slice of everything. And I think that is a problem, because quite often, that extra work has to be redone, because one of the other risks that was sort of ignored becomes a bigger problem, especially when it comes to online, and, and the whole thing has to be re-engineered. So we designed our process, our alpha process, to allow for that. 
Now also, as another sort of slight aside before I get onto the detail of that, a lot of people ask me, why Elite Dangerous? Why not Elite Four? Why not Frontier Three? First Encounters Two or whatever? Now, the, the problem is, and, and, and this is a sort of slightly embarrassing confession, the Elite Four, I had talked about it for a long time because I've wanted to make it a long time. We've had the odd discussion on and off with publishers but fundamentally, they've come to nothing. And it's largely because they say, well, we want creative control. This is the publisher. Um, we want, you know, and I know what will happen is it will go down a railroad, it would have gone down a railroaded path to something that wasn't the game that we wanted to make. But the point is, this is Elite Four, no bones about it. But I wanted something that was a fresh start. And we looked at the story behind the other names. So Frontier, it was because the key thing with Frontier versus Elite is the action takes place on the periphery, on the frontier. Because logically, from a story perspective, if you imagine sort of cowboy, semi-lawless worlds, they will tend to be on the frontier of human space. The core systems will be a lot more secure. You wouldn't get unruly systems so close. It would be a bit like you know, having um, uh, you know, anarchies in central London, or maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe that is true, I suppose. But you, you see what I mean? And so the story behind Elite Dangerous, right from the start, is we had to think, and this is where we sort of move slightly out of the game world and think about how we address players. One of the problems with multiplayer games that I've played and have seen issues with is where you have player versus player kills, and you have griefing and all of those things that come along with it, which spoils the gameplay for the majority where you have a few antisocial players. So we've been thinking about how we can structure the game rules that work within the story, where we have a way of addressing the issues of player versus player against player versus environment. Because right from the start, we didn't want the sort of thing where the player makes a decision to play on a PvP server, a PvE server, like you see on some games. And what we have done is we've extended the elite, well, sorry, the Federation of Pilots. This is an organization in the game where Think of it almost like a pilot's union. Every single player in the game is a member of this. Every single AI is not a member. So you already have this organization that puts bounties on the heads of people who kill its members. We have a way of differentiating, without breaking out of the story, a, a response. So the game can respond differently to people who are griefing players versus griefing AIs. I mean, clearly a game about piracy and attacking ships, you're going to have to do that. But we're structuring it in a way that where there is an advantage in trying to go against AIs more so than against other players. And so that player-player interactions tend to be cooperative more so than competitive. So within the Federation of Pilots, a giant organization by the year 3300, which is when Elite Dangerous is set, there is a subgroup called the Elite Federation of Pilots. And this group, is made up of all of those people, or was made up, that had reached the rank of elite. Imagine in the previous games, it took flipping ages, and uh, how many here actually genuinely reached elite? Uh, I can't see any hands. Oh, so someone here. Yeah, a few, a few people did. Well, I know the feeling, an uh, embarrassing confession, I never did. It took so long. Um, I, I, obviously, I, t I tested it, but I never genuinely did it without using, without using cheats. And the point is, imagine in real life where you have a, a system that is, let's face it, it's a kill counter, which I think is, is, is morally dubious anyway. But th that, that aside, um, it's essentially a time-serving thing rather than, an, an, a, than a, an ability test. So if you, were, if you postulate that there were such a real thing, every sort of El Presidente or whatever, when he wants his daughter taking to somewhere dangerous, or you know, they're going to want her to be taken by a pilot who's an elite pilot, someone, you know. So imagine there are masses of people of contracts going out for, for jobs to be done where they want an elite pilot. Most of those elite pilots know full well that the people who have reached the ranks of dangerous and deadly are just as good as them at flying, but just haven't served the time. So imagine if this secretive organization actually has a test to ad ad admit people with lower uh, um, sort of ratings into their organization who can fulfill these contracts and they can grant them an elite status. So that is what Elite Dangerous is. It's where you are part of the Elite Federation of Pilots and you're offered to be admitted to it and you'll be able to do this within a game. And, but you're, sort of, you're still at a lesser rank. 
So it's a bit like um, the uh, British Navy, for example, where you had the concept of a defaced ensign. Um, for those of you who may not know, uh, uh, British uh, military ships can fly a different flag, and people can also fly that privately, but it's defaced to say that this isn't a full military ship. So it's the same sort of principle as that. Anyway, that is why it's the title of the game, because that's so key to all the way the multiplayer plugs together. OK, so going back to the alpha. Um, so I'll just turn the sound down. It started in December 2013, as planned. And we looked at each of the key risks. And the biggest risk in the game in my opinion, certainly, is the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, is how it feels. If it doesn't feel right, if we can't crack that, then we haven't got a game. It's hardly worth playing, because people won't play for the rest of it. So the first alpha, Alpha Phase 1, which was launched on, I think it was 15th of December, um, was a test for single-player combat. And just to make sure we get that right, um, we did a lot of internal testing to try and get the feel, the mass of the ship, you know, how, how good it feels going up against in combat, and also how difficult it is. Because the other thing it tested is this is a game where we're not going to focus groups or anything. We are saying, well, would we like it like that? So a lot of questions came up is how complex should we make the controls? You know, being able to divert power to different parts of the ship, uh, being able to, you know, control of individual systems of the ship. When you get a weapon, can you target individual um, pieces of machinery on, on your ship and on other ships? And the answer is yes, we wanted that. We like that complexity. The only thing we didn't like is if you have to address it all at the start. So what we've come up with is a system where the default's sensible, you can play it, but you can delve in, you can have that level of richness. And I feel I've not really had that in games for such a long time. And, and you do sometimes have discussions with publishers where they say, oh, well, the target audience won't like that level of complexity. Well, we don't have to have those sort of conversations. We can say, would we like that level of complexity? And essentially, that's what Alpha's about. We're saying to the Alpha community, here it is, and enter into a dialogue. You know, is this too complicated? Or actually, would you like more control? Would you like more richness? And actually, it was more the latter. There were things that we put in like, for example, the, the ships fly like World War II fighters, let's face it. But that's because we're using something called flight assist, where it uses the retros on the ship to, to make it feel like you're flying a Spitfire. And you see all the rockets fire. And actually, the great thing, if you're following someone, is you get it telegraphs their moves. You can see the rockets appear instantly before you even see the motion starting. Now, I, I think that's great, but I was amazed by how many alpha backers and how soon people played with flight assist off, because it is difficult. But they got very, very good at it. It's a skill-based thing. And you do get an edge in combat when you use it. So that's great. But you don't have to play with it on. I don't play with it on, actually, because it's, it's a bit of a pain. I do sometimes. And often, you just blip it on, turn, and then, you know, so it's that sort of thing. It's a slightly new way of looking at it. It's the way, though, we looked at games back in the 80s. So it's a really good sort of throwback. But the key thing with Alpha 1 is it addressed that. And in that conversation that we had with backers, one of, the, some, one of the things that came up an awful lot was questions about things like uh, Oculus Rift. You know, anyway, I'll talk a bit more about Alpha 1 in a second. Um, then we planned Alpha 2 was to, to fold multiplayer in. I mean, Alpha 1 was all ready, multiplayer ready, and we had it running multiplayer in the office. But one of the problems is, I mean, we, we had um, Elite Dangerous running multiplayer, even during the uh, Kickstarter campaign. The trouble is it was running on a LAN. And for those of you who've done network coding, running on a LAN is way easier than running on the internet. You know, on a LAN, you have virtually zero ping times. You have virtually no packet loss. It's a very clean system. Um, you don't have packets overtaking them, each other. You know, all of these sort of things. Anyway, that was a key risk with multiplayer. Alpha 3 brought in our first game loop and a lot of behind-the-scenes systems. But it was the first time where you could earn money, spend it to upgrade your ship, go out. You know, you actually play the game continuously. A lot of people spent a lot of time doing that. That We found a lot of exploits, <laughs> which we <laughs> worked with people for that. Uh, but this is the point. This is what Alpha's about. And then, last week, we released Alpha 4, which actually is two separate things put together. It's, it's probably the biggest step in the Alpha process. And 
it brought in the galaxy map, travel, but also trading. Now, trading, when you've got lots of players, is a big issue, because we know, and they're already doing it, people will try and cooperate to bring down a market. And that's half the fun of a game. If everyone says, right, let's all take toothbrushes to this place and see what happens, you know, making sure it responds in a sensible way. So we have the first level of that. And so what we did is we broke down all these sort of pieces of work into separate elements and made them separate alpha phases. And so now we're at the end of that alpha process, essentially. So I already talked a little bit about it. Alpha 1 is this moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. And without it, we wouldn't have a, have a game. Um, we brought in so many things that I think we probably wouldn't have done in a publisher game. The heat mechanics are very complex and not obvious, because it's not immediately obvious that you reduce your heat signature by buttoning up. So uh, for those of you who haven't played the game, uh, ships are covered with, they glow almost white, yellowy white, um, these radiators that are underneath vents. They, they are, uh, one of the problems in space is it's very hard to get rid of heat. And the way you get rid of heat is by radiating it away. But the problem is that makes you incredibly visible, even to the human eye. But to a scanner, a, a passive, you, you wouldn't know you're being scanned because it's completely passive, but you're giving off such a strong heat signature. And that is how the scanners in the game work. If you can find a way of closing down that heat signature, you will be much less visible. So you'll be seen from a shorter range or possibly not seen at all. And so this is a wonderful gameplay mechanic. We, you can do things. So all of these the radiators have over the top of them uh, metal shutters. That you, With a button in the ship, you can close down shutters on the top of it, and you stop radiating heat almost altogether. And it's not unlike holding your breath, especially if you've been running around. Holding your breath is really hard. So you do that, and then suddenly the heat starts building up really quickly, and you'll start wrecking your ship. So it's a balance. But if you just want to disappear for a few moments, you go behind an asteroid or something, and they will lose you. It just gives you that bit of an advantage to get behind them. And so many other things, you know, the, the power distribution. You can take power away. You can shut down your shields. That will stop your ship, hit, ship heating up. If you want to play stealthily, you can fit your ships ship with weapons, which let, aren't, probably aren't as good, particularly projectile weapons. But the beauty with projectile weapons is most of the heat is carried away in the bullets. Unlike a laser, which gets really hot in itself and radiates for you know, 30 seconds or, or more or later afterwards, you can have a stealthy ship. And it's things like that that we, we key, key gameplay things we wanted to test to make it fun. Now, obviously, it's for other people to say, but there have been a lot of coverage of the game. I think people have really liked it. Now, the alpha backers have had this for quite a while now. Um, as of last week, premium beta people can play um, this uh, combat test as well, prior to the premium beta going live at the end of the month. Now, the other thing I mentioned on December 15th, we released uh, Alpha One. We got a lot of people saying, oh, this would be great on Oculus Rift, or this would be great in 3D, um, and even Track IR. Some of, maybe you don't know, but it's a head tracking thing which allows you, it gives you an extra dimension of control. Essentially, it's like an additional analog stick on the controller from your neck but you get used to it. Anyway, so as a Christmas present, we weren't originally planning to do it so early. We thought, OK, let's roll those into the game. It wasn't a huge job. So just before Christmas, in uh, December last year, we, brought, we added Oculus Rift support, 3D TV support, and Track IR support. And uh, have many of you played that? Because it's great. If you get a chance, do. Um, for those of you who are going to be at E3, we will be at E3, and you can come along um, to our room. And, and try it. It will be open to everybody. Uh, the other thing we pushed is audio. Uh, I'm always a huge, been a huge fan of audio. The difference it makes. Um, you know, I imagine a great film with no sound. It just doesn't have that feeling of immersion. So we put a lot of effort into the engine noises, every little relay and system you can hear as you switch it. It's they're in three D locations within the ship. Some of them are behind you. So it just gives you that real richness. You can hear the shots once your shields are down. You can hear things hitting your ship. It's, it's just, it's great. It's very, very immersive. So then um, followed up Alpha 2, where we added multiplayer. So we're using quite an innovative approach here. Uh, although we're still using moderated by our servers, which are all very scalable, we also use a lot of peer-to-peer -peer traffic to get to reduce the ping times for things that are non-critical. Um, you know, particularly for working out sound effects and all that sort of thing. And then it's corrected by server moderation. Uh, and that, for us, has proved very, very good. Um, but it was a key technological risk for, we're essentially an MMO, um, 
but just with a different way of implementing it. And the key thing that we wanted is not to, be, not to have to charge per month. So, you know, the whole issue with bandwidths with NMMO, which is a problem if you do everything server um, to the server only. Also, within Alpha 2, we had so many more features because we, we had the, a, a game loop where people could choose the way they behave. So, um, one of the scenarios, these were preset scenarios which you could go into. Um, one of them was an asteroid field with people mining it. You could choose to attack the miners for their cargo. You could choose to attack the people attacking the miners for their cargo. Um, now, once someone attacks, then they're, they're free game. They're a pirate as far as the game's concerned. And so they will have a bounty on their head. So you can make money just from the bounties. And so it was our first test of how we integrate PvP and PvE that I mentioned earlier. And I think that's been very, very successful. We've even seen vigilantism within Alpha 2, and more so Alpha 3, but where people are actually trying to stop, or rather profiting from PvP kills, which actually discourages future ones. So it's a beautiful balancing mechanic. Also within this, we had cargo scooping, we had stat tracking, so the game was becoming very much richer. But the important thing for us is it was really testing our back end. And um, you know, we, we did find quite a few issues. But you know, overall, it's, it's worked very well for us. So Alpha 3 was a very big step, mainly because there were so many little things that went in there. But it was the first time it actually felt like a game. We had a very rudimentary hyperspace. There was no effect. There was a loading screen, so it wasn't, it wasn't instant. But we had hyperspace and docking, and to me, it first felt like a game. It wasn't choosing preset scenarios from a list. It was actually flying between places. There was lots of additional key sort of behind-the-scenes network support needed for that, because effectively, people are migrating transparently between sessions. And there are a lot of challenges there to get that working well. Um, it mostly performed well. We found problems with certain kinds of hubs, because um, actually also at this point, our alpha was bigger than it was to start with. So we were um, sort of close to about 3,000 people playing. Um, and it's amazing. I mean, I actually find I was guilty of it as well. You upgrade your PC, you upgrade your network connection to be ever better, but often your hub, your switch, you still you haven't touched for ages. <laughs> and some of the new protocols, they simply didn't support. So, uh, you know, network code is actually a lot more complex than I think we'd actually expected, partly because Every network is slightly different in some way. Okay, so that was great. Alpha 3 was fantastic for us. And now, bringing us bang up to date, is Alpha 4. So this brought in so many key systems. This, I mean, essentially now, all of the systems that are needed to deliver the game are present. Um, you know, I'm not saying we won't do more on them. You know, and, and actually, if you look at the, the shot on the screen, you can see that is a view of the galaxy. And as you see in the background behind this gas giant, all of the dust and tendrils in there, we are modeling. We are generating procedurally. Every single star is a, is a real star in the system in the sky. And what's interesting to this is we've taken a lot of hard science to, to compose the galaxy. So every body that's in all sorts of star surveys, we've merged, we've fixed errors in the star surveys. And so in one place, possibly even for the first time, we've got a, a very consistent model of the galaxy. And it's rich enough that we can plot the night sky. But when we plotted the night sky, as viewed from Earth, it's really bright, and it's actually, it doesn't look right. So what we've then done is we've tuned the dust so that it actually matches the night sky when viewed from Earth. And what's interesting is there is way more dust than most scientific theories say there should be. But we can tell by just wandering outside on a clear day and looking. No, that's what it should be. So we are actually looking at that from, from sort of first principles. And there really is a lot of dust. But the great thing from a game point of view, it actually makes the night sky very interesting. So you don't need to fly very far in game terms from Earth for the night sky to change quite dramatically. Uh, for those of you who've played it, we've actually put in most of the Earth-centric constellations in the sky. But when you travel a little way, they all distort. But more importantly, we are bang in the middle of this dust. So our night sky is quite dark. But if you go, say, 100 light years directly out of the galactic plane, it's a bit like poking up 
you know, you, when you on a plane taking off from an airport, you get that amazing view when you come out of the clouds, looking out of the window, and you suddenly see right across. That's what it's like. And some of the systems, so Ashnar, for example, the um, center of the empire, uh, giant systems actually out of the galactic plane, so you can see across to the galaxy just a little bit. It's just so wonderful. All of this is because of procedural generation. Now, I'm sure you're watching behind me on the screen, you know, viewing, flying over Saturn's or Saturn like body's rings, a, a big gas giant. And you see the many billions of objects just in one ring system, all in the beautiful lines. That's all procedurally generated. You could see as we're flying at close to the speed of light over the rings, all of the bodies whizzing past, and now and then going down into them as we did then. So what you see here, for example, we've also introduced a whole load of new starships. This is something called a Lacon Type 9. It's a big, sort of essentially a big truck. It's a, it's a trade specialized ship, but it's got this wonderful, very practical cab sticking out right at the front. It's very easy to fly because of that, and you can see all around you. So each of the ships have different purposes. The ships up to Alpha 3 were all general purpose ships. So you see now, in this sort of, it's not unlike a crane cab. Uh, and you can see, it's, the, it's also the first, first ship with a multi-story cockpit, so you can see around it. So all of these things coming together to build the game that starts to feel like a coherent whole. So within our game, we've essentially got, if you like, one big, one big lie, scientifically speaking. So one of the problems with scientific accuracy is our galaxy is unbelievably huge. It's 70 plus thousand light years across um, the dense bits, or 100,000 if you measure it to the sort of tenuous edges. And the problem with that is, well, the clue's in the name. That means it will take 100,000 years at the speed of light to cross it. Now, clearly in a game, firstly, you can't travel at the speed of light anyway. And in fact, even accelerating to that speed in a meaningful time would turn you into a sort of a mush-like jam at the back of your cockpit, even if your, your ship could take it. So we have postulated it's possible to contract space by a very, very dramatic margin. And that allows us to do things flying around at huge speed like this, where you're actually traveling at multiples of the speed of light, and you can accelerate to those speeds really quite quickly. Now, unfortunately, there's no scientific basis for that, but if you assume it is possible to have some sort of drive mechanism to contract space, then what we've tried to do is be relatively consistent. And that gives us things like the supercruise that we've talked about, where you can fly around a system at many, many, many times the speed of light, where you can travel point to point between systems. But once you've got that, everything else we have made as scientifically accurate as we can. You know, no artificial gravity, no inertial damping, none of that sort of thing that um, a lot of science fiction films and books talk about. In order to get artificial gravity, we spin things. And that brings a lot of luxury. You will have seen in the earlier video the great big Imperial cruiser, which had a nice circular feature in the back. That's because the Empire is very, very sort of into luxury and red carpets and all that sort of thing. But one of the luxuries in space would be gravity. So even when your ship is, is stopped, that you, can, that you can sit down. I think gravity, I mean, seeing in the UK, they um, broadcast from the International Space Station some very interesting footage. But it's a pain in, in, gravity, in zero gravity. If you sneeze, your sneeze stays in the air for ages. You have to sort of mop it up with a, a tissue playing sort of like a 3D wiping a window. Um, if you drop something, it doesn't, it's not necessarily in reach. You know, it doesn't fall, it doesn't stay put. You can't put anything down unless it's got Velcro on the bottom. You know, and it's that sort of thing. Once you, even a low level of gravity is really, really useful. So we've, we've thought of all of those things. We've also put together a whole pile of what we call fiction Bibles. You know, everything from how do you eat in the 34th century to um, how do you get about a city? How do you talk to people? You know, culturally, you know, what, how do elections work? All of those sort of things. And that's been used to make the 15-odd fictional books that are coming out set in the elite world already. But that's the important thing here. We're not just, I don't think, make, I mean, obviously we're making a game. 
But what I mean is we, it's the world that you're immersed in that we're making, that we're most excited about. When I um, was a teenager, I was a huge fan of science fiction books, and I loved the worlds that they created, particularly people like Larry Niven, Jerry Pornell, all of those people of the late 60s, early 70s. And I remember in, I think it was 77 or 78, when Star Wars came out, being really, that was the first film that ever fitted that written science fiction, those written science fiction for worlds that I'd so loved. And not long after I saw it, someone described Star Wars to me as, oh, it's a standard rescue the princess story. Now, I got very angry by that because it wasn't to me. To me, it was a story about a world that was very different to ours. You know, that whole bar scene in Moss Eisley where the guy's arm gets chopped off and it goes quiet for a bit and then <laughs> the hubbub just restarts and that's it. I thought, wow, that's, that's, that's great, that's interesting. But the fact, okay, technically it's a Rescue the Princess story, but it's not. I went to see it and I saw it several times because I wanted to be immersed in the world. And I think it's very similar with gaming. The, the, the story isn't what it is, it's, it isn't the main thing. It's the world, the sentiments, the feeling, the atmosphere that it conveys, that certainly that I want from it. And I think that's true of a lot of other people. And that's what we've done here with Elite, or are in the process of doing, you know, getting that consistent richness. So you see this big cargo bay, for example, a place where the ships land. Absolutely huge, it's got air in it, you can walk around, but the rotation rate is set so that it's only about 0.1 gravity. So it's very low gravity. That means a, a normal, person could lift a one-ton weight over their head because it would weigh a tenth as much. It means landing your ship, it wouldn't be too dangerous. It, it just makes so much sense. And yet, further out on the station, you'd have much higher levels of gravity, which are more comfortable. You know, there's a lot of suggestion that uh, humans in zero-g, this is from the International Space Station again, and from Mir, have suffer bone loss and all sorts of health problems. We've, we've evolved to live in gravity, so it's a, it's a healthy thing to do. So you would have that. But in something like this, this inner area, it would make sense for it to be lower gravity. Anyway, sorry, there's, there's tons of detail behind this that I think is, is really great from a game design point of view, but also just from a sheer love of what we're making sort of thing. And I, I love that in games. And by the way, we renamed this space station Beagle 2 Landing after the very sad death of uh, Colin Pillinger, who was a great guy who I had the honor to be in a book with um, some years ago called Backroom Boys by Francis Spufford. He was the guy behind the super cheap launching of um, a probe to Mars. Did it for way less than anyone else, where everyone else, all the other projects from NASA had cost billions. You know, his cost millions. And it worked in the sense it got there. Due to one minor technical problem, it actually hit the ground too hard, uh, they think, and smashed. But the point is, he delivered that, and he did a fantastic job doing it, and he was a great guy, and we need more people who can evangelize science and not make it into the super expensive... You know, in, in some ways, it was the sort of Raspberry Pi spacecraft. He did it, he undercut everyone, he delivered something that was great. It was a real shame. I think had it succeeded completely, we would have had probes all over the solar system now by, of that sort of approach. Anyway, sorry, that's a separate, a separate point. Now, Premium Beta is a week away, and Premium Beta players are already playing. So the great thing here is, you know, from, from the Kickstarter through development, we've made a game in quite a different way. Or, or, by the way, all this video is just taken straight from the game. Um, with full beta to come, we will gradually ramp out the number of different people involved, adding more and more content. But from a development point of view, it's been absolutely brilliant, this engaging directly with people who care about the game, who really care, who aren't just looking at it as something that will appear on a balance sheet in the future, but as something that really matters, um, really matters to them and to how, um, how they want to play games. You know, there's been so much positivity that it's, it's, it's a great process. I would recommend it to everybody. Um, I'm sure some of you have already, how many people here have already d done a Kickstarter type campaign that's been successful? Probably a dozen people. Am I talking rubbish? Am I just one of the lucky people <laughs> for whom it's worked well? 
maybe. Okay. So, a lot of people have said negative things to me about the process. Um, you know, they said, oh, look, you've talked about not having a publisher, isn't it great? But surely now you've got, you know, 45,000, 50,000 publishers. And yes, to an extent, that's true. And my experience over the years, I mean, working with Acornsoft, for example, right at the start, they weren't a publisher because they were made up of people who were huge fans of games and huge fans of technology. It's when the publisher starts talking about return on investment and all this sort of thing when you cannot prove how well a game's going to do. None of us really know. And it comes down to how good it is. And, you know, everyone says, oh, yes, we're going to make it great. But you've got to find a way of, of, of managing that. And you get, or, you get into a set of discussions that are just very, very different to what they should be about in terms of making the game better. Now, it's true, we do, in a sense, have 50,000 publishers that all perhaps want slightly different things. But what we are doing is engaging in a conversation and trying to be very, very sensible about this and make a decision. You know, if people shout from the rooftops, oh, that's terrible, we will look at it and say, and then put it to the rest of the people, you know, is this what we should be doing? You know, so the, the, the other sort of related question is, is it a big overhead to manage backers? And it is an overhead, yes. But it's, it's an overhead that's productive. It's a very big overhead managing a publisher relationship, any relationship in life is an overhead, it's just what is the benefit. And I think the benefit is really important. And you know, the, the, the other one, how do you know who, who to listen to? The answer is, you listen to everybody, and generally, people will shout down, it's clear what people want from it. You, you don't have to be a genius to filter out the best things to do here. I mean, the process for us has been really good. It's worked very, very well for us. And I think the other point, the, the clincher here, especially for people here from game development point of view, is the break-even point is much lower. In other words, and this is the true of indie development as well, in a sense, um, it makes the number of units that we have to sell to be able to do, you know, to keep going much, much lower. And so actually it's lower risk, and therefore so much more attractive um, from a development point of view. Okay, so what I thought I'd do is have 15 minutes of questions and answers. So, uh, anyone want to kick off with some questions? If you could shout it out. Well, with all of this, so just, just for those who didn't hear the question, you're asking about Eve um, tried bringing in bounties, and then you, you had a problem where a friend of a pirate would just kill him to get the bounty. Yes, there are exploits here, and we are looking at how those work, because, of course, we know who killed that friend. But actually, when you think about it, that will happen, but it doesn't mean people are still incentivized to, um, you know, that, to kill, so if a normal player comes along and is killed by a pirate, yes, a bounty goes on that guy's head. Um, okay, if his friend comes along, kills the pirate, he gets a bounty, but the way the system works is that when that pirate restarts, you, you know, the whole insurance policy thing, you still potentially have to buy out the bounty. It's probably better to look at the way our system works. Um, it certainly seems to be working at the moment. We will fine-tune it through the beta and, and thereafter. But the point is, it seems to be working now, and that's all I can say. I, I don't know the, the, the exact details of the EVE system, of how that worked and why it didn't work. It's also possible that they didn't persist for long enough. Um, but with all of these things, you've got to go with the basic system, and we actually have it to multi-layered approach, because we also have... Um, a way where we can uh, partition the, the gameplay so that you can have, you know, we, we already, when a, a system's very crowded, we uh, partition it so that you have separate instances of a system where all the trading and that sort of thing is still um, agglomerated, but the people won't actually see them within the same session. So it's sorted based on friends and all sorts of things. We can move antisocial players away from each other 
And that is something that we do plan to do, but we don't plan to do in the, the normal case. So I think it is a small part of a solution to what I f fully admit is a very difficult problem. Okay, another question. Uh, yes, there's someone here at the edge. Yeah, uh, I was just wondering uh, when you have this. Oh, sorry. When you have this process where you are like getting all your backers to give you design feedback, how do you ensure that you don't end up with like the most vocal people are often the ones wanting more realism or more uh, hardcore experience? How do you ensure that it doesn't end up as a very uh, narrow game only for people who are really into? Uh, things being as realistic as possible, but very hard to access for more casual players or newcomers to the genre. Yes, uh, absolutely. The um, and the answer is that's why it's a, it's a forum. It's an open discussion. Um, it, partly we make sure we try to keep it not narrow. Um, but I think in addition, the um, because we've got whatever forty five thousand backers. Uh, who, and we have a lot of forums, we have a lot of people who are vocal in different directions. Um, we just have to be careful about that and raise it. And so we can ask the question back, doesn't this narrow the game? And so as long as we have a way, it's like with the, um, the power distribution and the heat mechanic. Can I play the game without even knowing about it? And if the answer is yes, then it's not narrowing the appeal of the game. So with all of those, same with Super Cruise, same with a lot of the other free features that did come in through the design discussion forum. The point is they, didn't, they haven't narrowed the game because had we not done it, you would still have a similar type of experience. Does that make sense? Generally, yes, so generally the features are, it's not that they're optional, they're there, but it's up to you whether you want to take advantage of it, but then you get a slight advantage by doing so. You know, it, it's, an, it's an interesting balance, and we can tune that balance over time. Does that explain it? Okay, thank you. Um, in the middle here, the guy with the hand up. So yeah, so um, absolutely, I do see it happening, and it's already happening now. We have a lot of fan fiction set in the world, and what we're asking is the, the fiction bibles I mentioned. As long as people stay consistent with that, so we have a coherent world, they use sort of venues and locations from the game, you know, all of the various uh, uh, different sort of legal and political systems, we know who's, who was president, who was emperor in each period through time. And so... Um, Yes, I think all of those things are hugely additive to the world. Uh, we have, I think it's some 15 books coming out already, and the fictions that are the basis of those books are actually in the game already. You know, you can read about them, so this might be where there was a particular rebellion, and one of the books actually talks about the detail and the character in the rebellion, um, which has now been resolved. And, and it's that sort of, of, of richness that I think is wonderful. When you, um, you know, it, it, it's sort of hinted at in Star Wars. You also see it with the other sort of, um, you know, big fictional worlds where they, they're, they're so rich, you feel you can just keep digging and the consistency remains. But yes, absolutely. It's, it's mainly because this is something that I absolutely love and it's lovely to see it coming into games. I mean, even the term game, I think it becomes a bit wrong somehow in the same way. The term film is wrong, given that most film never touches celluloid and start to finish these days. 
So I, I think what we're making is something that we want to participate in, you know, and, and that, this is a good way of arriving at it. You know, the, the, whether it's what the decal is for somewhere, it's trying to get that consistency, because we need it internally. We've got a big team working on this game already, and the point being is that all of those people also need to think, well, all right, what, what's written on the side of this ship? And, and the answer is, is there in the, the, the fiction Bibles. Okay, another question, please. Uh, yes, in the black shirt in the middle. Um, okay, so the question is, how did the Kickstarter campaign affect the planning of the development? Because we were essentially relying on funding from the Kickstarter. So the answer is, um, we would... I think confident that we would succeed with the Kickstarter. But having said that, you know, it's a case of degree, response, the, the way the conversation during the Kickstarter go, uh, went. You know, so there were a lot of questions during the Kickstarter raise that affected development. So prior and during the Kickstarter, we just had a loose plan of how we could deliver. And then by the end of the Kickstarter, we worked out in detail how we would deliver all the different things. Um, you know, we'd, we'd, we had talked loosely about the, the timing in the Kickstarter, and yet a lot of the um, design discussions that came during development and also were discussed during the Kickstarter slightly changed that, so that the timing, the alpha phase, actually got a lot longer than we said it would be during Kickstarter. That was partly because we decided to put a lot more in there. Um, in terms of um, engaging with people as well, you know, that the, the planning was only loose. It's when you start nailing down things, right, okay, that's going to take three weeks, that's going to take four weeks, you know, this is going to take five people to do it, and all that overlap. That's a very big, complex process. And um, we only did that, most of that, we only did the high level before the Kickstarter, and after the Kickstarter, we did it in a lot more rich detail. Uh, so I think also, with a lot of these things, you, you think and make disc have discussions, and um, during the Kickstarter, you know, a lot of the questions, what features are in the game, what features are post the release of the game. So a lot of things sort of became quite sort of crystallized, you know, in terms of features we, have to, we offer after first release, you know, things like landing on planets, landing on airless moons, getting, walking around your spaceship, all of that sort of thing is, re represents huge amounts of content to do well. Now, it would be very easy, and I think people had sort of expected us to cave in and say, oh, we'll do that, we'll do this. And in the end, you end up throwing too many things in, and it becomes either a mishmash, and none of them are going to be high quality. And I, I, I'm, I'm quite proud that actually we said, no, we're not going to do landing on planets within that time, but we will do it over time. And we even showed some video just to show, you know, we, we've done a lot of work on that, even prior to the Kickstarter. So the point is, we will do it, it's just, trying to be true to people, to say, this is what you'll get, we'll do that at high quality, we will follow on to do more things at ever better, ever higher quality. And I hope what's happened is people will have seen the cadence of the alpha, the way we've delivered a lot of very, very rich content already, and it's only going to keep getting better. And, and I think the danger with Kickstarter, a, a really big danger with Kickstarter, is to overpromise, To say, oh, we'll do this, and we'll do this stretch goal for this extra amount of money, and all this sort of thing and then suddenly realize that actually it's a really hard thing to deliver. Um, and so I think there's a lot of responsibility on the people going to Kickstarter that um, you've really got to plan, and if you do offer something, be serious about how you are going to be able to deliver that. Okay, I think there's time for one more question here. Uh, you touched on the Kickstarter thing, so how do you feel about Star Citizen and the $40 million it made? <laughs> Well, it's still making as well. Um, I'm a, I, I like Chris Roberts, he's great. Um, I don't know if you saw on our Kickstarter, we did a long, great sort of video chat. We actually ended up breaking into four sections, there was so much of it, um, with the excellent Gary Witter as well, who's a, a mutual friend. And I think the important thing is, is Chris, they, we, we're coming at a similar set of problems from a different direction. Uh, you know, Chris has corporate backing and all that sort of thing, which is, is fine, as opposed to, some, to it in a different manner, so do we. But the, the point is, we are essentially trying to take game development to ourselves, and that is the brilliant thing. Um, I am a backer, an alpha backer of uh, uh, Star Citizen. Chris is an alpha backer of us, you know. It's great. I want to play his game. 
they're a lot more story-based. We're a lot more um, sort of broad multiplayer, all that sort of thing. You know, they're quite different games. And the point is, that, you know, they're at different timescales as well. But the fact that we're doing them, that's great for our industry. Really, really good. And um, I, I, I really hope they succeed as well as us succeeding. You know, they, they have, we all have a lot of challenges here and we're addressing them in different ways. And I think we will, we will get two great games out of them. You know, Wing Commander is a very different game to Elite, for example, or to Frontier. You know, so there is space here. What's actually ironic is there's been no space game for, what, best part of a decade, really. I mean, discounting EVE, because it's a very different experience. I mean, people often look at, and at, th at games like Elite and say, why hasn't there been another space game? Well, I've not really seen Elite or Frontier as a space game, which is bizarre. I've seen them both as essentially open world games. It's the freedom that it gives you that makes it the game that it is. It happens to be set in space, and the irony is it was set in space in the early days because that was the easiest thing to render on a BBC Micro. <laughs> you know, and so it, publishers don't see that either. And, but so the point is, I wish Chris absolutely the best, and, and uh, Robert Space Industries, you know, Cryo Imperium Games or whatever, um, all the best. I think they, I really hope they succeed. They, they, you know, they, they will do something that's really good. It will be very different to what we're doing, but that's a good thing. You know, in the same way, I enjoyed the Battlestar Galactica series of TV things. You know, I enjoyed Star Wars um, and, and so many others. Uh, it doesn't mean, you know, I love science fiction set in space. It's a great thing. And, um, you know, good luck to them. And, I'm, you know, I, I think the important thing here is games are getting better. That's what matters, and that's what we should celebrate. Right, so if I wind up there, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Um, and uh, thank you very much to the Nordic Games Festival for inviting me. It's been fantastic. So thank you. One last thing, we are hiring if you want to join us. Go to our website, thank you. <laughs>